welcoming and the opening remarks to the to the, the deputy speaker, but we are really excited to be able to have the the esteemed gentlemen in our midst and for them to be able to take us through the path of our icon, Madiba, and particularly the people of Palestine of which we are <coughs> sorry, we are in solidarity, particularly in the current circumstances that they are actually experiencing. So, members, uh, in short, that is what we wanted to 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 uh, brief you about. That, and we want to thank the project team for the fact that they were able to get us this esteemed scholars that can take us through the areas. And we also want to uh, express our appreciation to Honorable Dango as a former diplomat, is always assisting in making sure that we get the correct people that is knowledgeable about the subjects that we want to share with our members. So with that said and done, we are almost, it's almost 10 o'clock and we hope the deputy speaker is already uh, locked on so that we can then uh, uh, give over to him to, to do the opening remarks for us. But I will at exactly 10 o'clock request that we observe a moment of silence, a, a moment of silence, not only for, the, for Madiba, but also for what the Mandela family is going through at the current moment and also for those that are the victims and the, and the survivors of the current pandemic that is going across the world so that we observe that moment of silence, prayer or meditation to make sure that even in our, in our deliberations of today, we think about those that have shared this space with us but are no more. It's exactly 10 o'clock, and I want to request that all of us observe a moment of silent prayer or meditation before we will give over to the deputy speaker for the opening remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to everyone because all of us believe that in some way or another there is some presence that is greater than us and we are giving our honor and our glory to that. Honorable Deputy Speaker, we will now give over to you to do the opening remarks. Honorable Deputy Speaker, the Chisa Tsenodi. Speaker, we are well, thank you very much. I realized I was uh, muted here. I was saying, uh, uh, Good morning and welcome to our guests and honorable members present today, and all other participants in uh, uh, this morning's memorial lecture. Uh, we do so conscious that. This particular memorial lecture takes special significant place. I do wish to link uh, it to, before I say anything about our guests, just briefly, that um, to add my voice to a memory of Zenzi Mandela, who I had the pleasure of meeting in Denmark um, where she served as our ambassador there. One of our agreements with her was that when she comes back home, we would have an opportunity to interact with her formally, to talk about her experience of children and how she admired some of the ways in which their programs were being handled in Denmark and elsewhere, given her experience. Unfortunately, given what has now happened, uh, we will not be able to do that with her. But we really uh, send our condolences to the family and friends and comrades around the country and the world uh, for her passing away. The memorial lecture uh, takes place in the middle of a pandemic, 
but also in the middle of a crisis of huge socioeconomic uh, 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 situation that uh, uh, this pandemic has actually simply exacerbated. And so it makes significant not only our own uh, response to it, but globally and internationally, how we work together with others um, to deepen uh, the response we make, unlike what we may have done in the past. So our guests uh, in remembering Madiba, uh, whose international day, in a sense, we are thinking about, will help us locate the work we must do onwards uh, in the light of Madiba's own love of children and the work she did indefatigably in broader terms, but in specifically also with relationship to issues directly related to children. So we are really delighted that we have the two guests here. Um, Prof. Ron Greenstein uh, from Wits and Naeem Jina. I'm glad to be with you in the same platform. I've often listened to you on radio uh, making uh, commentaries, uh, very interesting ones as well. Uh, welcome both of you. And um, we would like you to share with us some of your insights. Uh, the deputy chair played an important role in identifying you as people uh, who would really give us uh, particular insights on the matters of our reconstruction and development in the world, in our relationship with others such as in Palestine. And therefore, uh, we are looking forward to the messages you are going to leave with us to reflect on and to shape uh, some of the work we are going to do. Parliament in the past took resolutions in support of the Palestinian struggle, other than what Madiba himself said often. And so it is part and parcel of an agenda we are pursuing uh, to improve our relationship with the people of Palestine and to see to their freedom, which ours, as Madiba correctly said, would not be uh, completely fulfilled without their freedom. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, Prof. Greenstein, I think I'd like to give you to start. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. We will now go to Professor Ron Greenstein and we will allow him to make his input on South Africa's solidarity with Palestine. Yeah. Prof. Professor Greenstein. Whilst we are waiting for for the prof to, to I get am, in order. I am here. Can you hear me? We yes. hear you now. Thank you, Prof. I just okay. wanted to say whilst we are waiting for you, we can sing for Nelson Mandela. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it later. Okay. Um Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great honor. It's an honor to speak to Parliament and it's a particular honor to speak on this uh, special day, uh, Mandela's Day. And I'm very happy to be here and with my colleague uh, Naeem Gina as well. Let me start by taking us to the point of origin of the current Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And that is <clears throat> 1948. In 1948, to put it uh, simply, Palestine was destroyed and Israel came into being. The two developments were part of the same process. The creation of Israel came at the expense of the indigenous Palestinian community, whose members sought independence for the country as a whole. Instead of gaining their independence, the society was violently broken up in the course of the 1948 war. Many of them, up to 60% of the population, were forced to flee their homes and became refugees. And they remain refugees to this day. 
parts of the country were transformed into Israel and other parts were occupied by Arab military forces, those of Jordan and Egypt. Today, we call this process ethnic cleansing. This, this terminology didn't exist at the time. But Palestinians use the term Nakba, which means disaster, catastrophe, to refer to the destruction of their own society. The outcome of the 1948 war was a unified state of Israel with a majority Jewish population controlling 77% of the territory, with the rest of the country divided between Jordan, ruling over what became known as the West Bank, and Egypt, controlling the Gaza Strip. The capital, Jerusalem, was divided between Israel and Jordan. Palestinians were left with no political independence and with a fragmented society divided into three main parts. A minority of 15% of them stayed put in their homes and communities and became citizens of Israel. They suffer marginalization as lower status citizens, but they also enjoy some real political rights compared to the rest of the Palestinian people. Another 35% of Palestinians remained in the historical territory of Palestine, the Arab rule, not their own independent rule, but under Egyptian and Jordanian rule. And 50% found themselves as stateless refugees in neighboring countries such as Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. 20 years later, in 1967, Israel completed the takeover of Palestine by force and the residents of the West Bank and Gaza became subject to military occupation, which continues to this day, 53 years later, almost to the day. The 1967 occupation has become the epicenter of the conflict, but we must put it, we must pay particular attention to it, but we must put it in the context of the overall conquest and dispersal of the Palestinian society that started in 1948. Of course, 1948 was also an important date in South African history with the rise of apartheid. And that is no coincidence. In both countries, apartheid in South Africa, the Nakba in Palestine, were responses to the conditions created after the end of the World War, the collapse of empires, particularly the British Empire, and the beginning of decolonization of the Third World. When we talk about apartheid in the context of Israel-Palestine, we need to take all aspects of the situation into account. Israel is an apartheid state in the sense this concept is defined in international law. The Rome Convention of 2002 defines apartheid, I'm quoting, an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression and domination by one racial group over another. This definition does not have to be identical to the historical regime in South Africa in order to qualify as a form of apartheid. So South Africa, of course, is where apartheid was first implemented, but the concept today goes beyond South African borders and it has a global significance and it serves to identify regimes that oppress and dominate some parts of their population by force. And Israel qualifies in these terms. But Israel practices apartheid of a special type. It's not identical to South Af African apartheid. It's a different kind of apartheid. It combines formal democracy within its original 1948 boundaries with military rule over millions of subjects who have no access to any political rights in the 1967 occupied territories and with total exclusion of the 1948 refugees and their, their descendants from any claim to rights in their ancestral homeland, not even the right to visit it or to set foot in it. So this form of exclusion of the refugees is actually much worse that, than anything um, that featured in the original South African apartheid. And it's important to consider it as an element of the overall picture. Israel claims to be a democracy within its own boundaries, 
But these boundaries are no longer valid. In practice, Israel controls the entire territory of historical Palestine, from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River. And it rules the entire population, but with only half of them, Jewish citizens and minority of Palestinians, as right-bearing citizens. The rest, a population of 5 million people, live under occupation and they enjoy no political or civil rights. They live alongside hundreds of thousands of Israeli settlers that enjoy full access to all the rights and resources of full citizens. The Palestinian Authority has nominal power over Palestinian residents, but it has no power at all over Israeli settlers who live in the same territory. All the essential aspects of politics, economics, trade, services, are effectively dominated by the Israeli regime, which gives Palestinian residents no say in the way they are governed. How do we deal with this situation? First, we must recognize that Palestinians have been organizing for decades and fighting for their own rights. There are three main forces that operate among them. The Palestinian Authority dominates politically the West Bank, Hamas is a major force in the Gaza region, and the joint list, that's a parliamentary front, is the dominant force among Palestinian citizens of Israel. Alongside these forces, the more formal political forces, there are hundreds of civil society organizations, human rights organizations, youth organizations that operate independently, and also movements that represent progressive Israeli Jews who believe in equality and justice and work alongside their Palestinian colleagues. They are a minority within their own society, but they are still an important force for change that we must take into consideration. A strategy of solidarity must take all of these forces into consideration, not just work with governmental forces, not just with civil society forces, but try to develop um, ways and means of collaborating and enhancing the activities of all of them. Second point we need to consider is that in order to contribute to change, we must combine external pressure with internal developments. We must combine external pressure on the Israeli government with support for those fighting it from within. What kind of external pressure would be most effective? There are many different ways of exercising it. I would suggest two avenues in particular that are relevant for South African forces, political forces to adopt. The first one would be to transform the existing South African policy of labeling products from the occupied territories into a ban on all products from illegal settlements. These settlements, for Jews only, occupy land that was confiscated from Palestinian residents by force or through some kind of legal tricks that leaves them a disadvantage. They are illegal in terms of international law and their produce is also illegal. Therefore, I would urge Parliament to consider a ban on all such products. This would, of course, require a process of identification of what products specifically we are talking about. And that could be undertaken in coordination with the United Nations Human Rights Council that has produced reports about these very specific issues and has identified many companies and products that operate or are producing these illegal settlements. The second avenue of um, or strategy that I would suggest to parliament, to government, to civil society forces is to sever all security cooperation, training and armed purchases between South Africa and Israel, and they go both ways. Any participation in such activity is a direct benefit to the regime of occupation. It's not normal trade, it's not normal economic relation, it's direct assistance to relationship of oppression, and therefore they must be restricted or banned altogether, whether they are undertaken by state or private agency. 
Beyond that, I would call on the South African government, the parliament and civil society organization to act positively to enhance the capacity of Palestinian and progressive Israeli groups to unify their efforts, to learn from the South African experience, to engage in joint educational and political initiatives, and to work together on the global scene. Every political struggle must find its own way and develop its own strategy. But to the extent that the successful South African anti-apartheid campaign can help inspire others, we must aim to do that. This is what we can do to give substance to President Mandela's famous saying, that the liberation of South Africa will not be complete without the liberation of Palestinians. Palestinians ultimately will liberate themselves, but any additional assistance from within their society, from outside, by external forces, and particularly by South Africa, which carry the burden of historical apartheid, but also the hope of liberation from apartheid will be particularly welcome. Thank you very much for listening to me and thank you very much for the opportunity and all the best to all of us. Thank, thank you very much, Professor Greenstein. Mm -hmm. Honorable members, honorable delegates, participants. I think we will take now, we can take about uh, 10 minutes to have a, a, a discussion. We will have a broader discussion later on both the topics. But I think whilst this is very fresh, if there is anyone that want to make a slight uh, remark or, or, or any, uh, any question, we, uh, we will give you the opportunity now. Use the, use the, the ratio and function, please. If there is no one, we will continue with the second uh, input, but there is someone that wants to say something. Hanif Hendricks, introduce yourself and you may speak. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Honorable Honorable Chair. Uh, Hanif Hendricks, leader of Al-Zawa in Parliament. Uh, Honorable Chair, fighting apartheid together strengthened the bond between resistant fighters from South Africa and Palestine. It was a Palestinian office in Libya that lobbied for the first tranche of weapons from brother leader Muammar Gaddafi, much needed to bring down apartheid. We watched as the weapons were sent to Angola and a Russian truck brought it to Freiburg near Kimberley to be received by Comrade Modisi. The struggle of the Palestinians captured the imagination of President Mandela and he developed an African love for the Palestinian people. Africa's commitment to continue fighting apartheid is gaining momentum as it is the only continent that the Palestinians can today depend on. The majority of Africans in the continent has a close commitment to do what they can to help free Masjid al-Aqsa and so does Christians and Muslims all over the world to free Jerusalem from occupation. Former President Mandela loved the children of Palestine. And it is said that every day, a hundred Palestinian children are put in Israeli jails. It is inhuman beings that carry the flag for apartheid. Many still in South Africa and their voices will not be heard in this parliament today. But there are more and more Jews loving the Torah and rejecting apartheid and we salute them. Lastly, Honorable Chair, we salute the South African government and the leaders of the African National Congress especially their young cadres, for taking the baton from President Mandela and running the last miles to free occupied Palestinian lands and bring down apartheid and fingering the inhuman being stubbornly still supporting apartheid Israel. The debate today is a most fitting way to honor former President Nelson Mandela. A message his daughter, resistance fighter Zinzi, will now share with him. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Honorable Hendrix. We will also give to Honorable Singh what we would want. After the second speaker, we would want all of us to participate in the discussion because I can see it's really, really something that is very close to our hearts. Honorable Nam Singh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chairperson of the NCOP, and I greet uh, Honorable uh, Comrade Lachesa as well. 
and thank Parliament for having organised this uh, uh, lecture today and on, on such a sad day when we are bearing an icon and somebody who's contributed so much to society and we remember Tata Nelson Mandela. Uh, thank you to Professor Greenstein for his presentation. Prof, I'd just like to know, you know, a couple of things in my mind. We talk about the United Nations and, and what they are supposed to do or not. Are you satisfied that the United Nations is doing enough to bring about peace and contribute to the liberation of the people of Palestine? Because, you know, we get reports upon reports upon reports, but very little action. So I'd just like to comment on that. And on South Africa's role as well, we've severed diplomatic ties, but there's still this liaison between us and Israel. What would your comments be with regard to that, given that you say that we should uh, you know, uh, server relations with Israel. Thank you. I would, I would not want Prof to respond immediately. I would want us to go into the second uh, presentation, and at the end, we will allow ample time to both the the presenters to to so that we have a very very comprehensive discussion. I just, I just wanted some commentary at this moment. And I want to thank the, the two members that have actually brought up some commentary and some clarifications because I can I, I feel that we will have to discuss the role of the human the United mm -hmm. Nations with regards to this issue. So for now, let us go to to Mr. Naim Gina to to make his input, and then after that we will take all the time for discussion. It is a it is a, a proposal, and I agree with it. So we will give to. Mr. Naim, Gina, Mr. Gina, over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Honorable Deputy Chairperson of the NCOP, Comrade Sylvia Lucas. Honorable Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly, Comrade Lechisa Tsenodi. Honorable Members, com Comrades. <clears throat> Before I begin, I want to extend my condolences and the condolences of my colleagues and comrades to the Mandela family on the loss of their daughter, our sister, and Comrade Zinzi. Comrade Zinzi's death reminds us of the many struggles we still have to win in our country and in the world against impoverishment, climate change, occupation, colonialism, apartheid, capitalism, and for justice, economic liberation, and freedom. It also reminds us of the very immediate and urgent challenge we face of COVID-19. May she rest in peace and may she and her parents be witnesses to, uh, to us never dropping this, this fear. The other little comment before I begin is to note that uh, Comrade Lechisa and I both signed the Global South call against Israeli annexation of Palestinian land. Such gestures from the leadership of our legislature, I believe, are important for Palestinians who are being betrayed all over the world. I want to thank uh, Ron Greenstein for his uh, input and in a sense, mine, uh, my input will be adding to the comments that Ran has already made. The statement by Comrade Nelson Holislasla Mandela, we know, all, we know too well that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians, has been quoted across the length and breadth of our country and across the world. It is a popular quote within the Palestinian solidarity movement and among Palestinians. One can understand why, of course. It is a quote from Madiba. And for Palestinians, it is affirmation of their struggle by the global icon of justice, the freedom fighter, Nelson Mandela. But beyond the identity of the person saying this, it is very important. what is very important is the substance and meaning of the comment, its implications for solidarity and for South Africa. Indeed, Madiba encapsulates in this sentence about the Palestinian people the essence of solidarity itself. Because solidarity, comrades, is not about doing for others. It is very much also about doing for ourselves. Solidarity is not about humanitarian assistance, pity, or giving. Solidarity is a political act. Rather, it is a political process that, gen that creates political and, dare I say, loving in the Guevara's understanding of revolutionary love relationships. I stress this point because in the era of NGOization, and Palestine is a wonderful example of the worst meanings of this term, solidarity for many has come to mean less a process of struggling together and more one of privileged people being human rights defenders or providing humanitarian assistance. 
whether this, this is food aid or campaigns for political prisoners. For too many people, solidarity is viewed in an individualistic way to campaign for injustices perpetrated against this or that person rather than the overwhelming structures of oppression that keep entire oppressed populations under their jackboots. It is saddening that many of us, even erstwhile liberation fighters, have succumbed to the allure of neoliberal material benefits and allowed the attraction of lucre to trump the demands of solidarity. Chandra Mohanty wrote that solidarity must be based on, quote, a common context of struggles against specific exploitative structures and systems. We therefore approach the question of solidarity with the people not as privileged Northerners do, but as people of the global South, grappling with our own legacy and current reality of, quote, exploitative structures and systems, of apartheid, and as, quote, conscious, as a con conscious alliance of the progressive and peace-loving revolutionary forces in the common struggle against colonialism, capitalism, and imperialism, as we were taught by Comrade Samora Michel. For us then, international solidarity should never mean doing something for someone else. It is primarily about developing relationships between oppressed peoples, even if in the case of some oppressed people, they have more privileged, uh, they have more privilege. As in our case, compared to the Palestinians, we have a state, we have a government, we have a parliament, even if these are also terrains of struggle, we have a sovereign nation. The Palestinian people have none of these. When Madiba says we will not be free until the Palestinians are free, he's tying our fate, the fate of an oppressed people, or, or formerly oppressed people if you wish, though I don't agree with that description, with the fate of other oppressed people. In supporting Palestinian resistance and Palestinian struggles for justice, Madiba is telling us we are charting a course for our own liberation. But Madiba didn't just speak about the Palestinians. Long before the regular Israeli onslaughts on Gaza, such as in 2008-2009 and in 2014, long before Israel used the Oslo Accords to undermine the Palestinian struggle as an excuse to construct illegal settler towns in the West Bank, long before Israel's hundreds of checkpoints made miserable the daily lives of Palestinians, long before the illegal hermetic siege of Gaza, Madiba said of Israel in 1990, if one has to refer to any parties as a terrorist state, one might refer to the Israeli government because they are the people who are slaughtering defenseless and innocent Arabs in the occupied territories. The PLO, he said, we don't regard as a terrorist organization. It was a clear understanding of what constitutes terrorism and where our solidarity should lie. But if our solidarity is founded on a context of shared struggles and on love of other oppressed people, then surely it is hypocritical, hypocritical for us to pat ourselves on the back, telling ourselves that we are fulfilling our responsibility by statements and speeches on significant days while continuing, continuing our lives as if the world is normal and without concrete action towards realizing the freedom of the Palestinians, which will also be our freedom. It is not sufficient that we deploy the revolutionary slogans of our own struggle, such as each one teach one, when talking about the Palestinian struggle, but do not imbue our actions with the revolutionary fervor that accompanied those slogans. Let us remember that Madiba's statement, our freedom is incomplete, was not made in the heady days of struggle, not in the 1960s, not after 1976, not in the 1980s. It was made in 1997. It was a commitment made not by the president of the ANC, but by the head of state of a democratic South Africa, suggesting that that state, supposedly a liberated state, was also not free until, and implicitly committing that state to achieving its own freedom and that of the Palestinian people. Our stated solidarity and commitment must result in practical consequences for us as a people, as a state, as a parliament. And I want to turn my attention now to a few of these to add to the few that Ron has already provided us, particularly as they are relevant to parliament and to government. 
Yesterday, comrades, was the 57th anniversary of the address of Ma Mama Miriam Makeba to the UN Special Committee on Apartheid. In her speech, which resulted in her not being able to return to South Africa, Makeba said, I ask you and all the leaders of the world, would you act differently? Would you keep silent and do nothing if you were in our place? Would you not resist if you were allowed no rights in your own country because the color of your skin is different from that of the rulers? And if you are punished for even asking for equality, I appeal to you and to all countries over the world to do everything you can to stop the coming tragedy. I appeal to you to save the lives of our leaders, to empty the prisons of all those who should never have been there. Who of us comrades, especially the black people among us, cannot see Palestine described in the words of Mama Miriam Makeba and before her, in the words of Amilka Cabral and Mualimu Julius Nyerere, both of whom strongly supported the Palestinian struggle. We are not fooled by the apologists of apartheid and colonialism who demand that we not equate Israeli racism to South African racism of the past. We who have lived as black people under apartheid know it when we see it. We know what it feels like on our bodies, what it tastes like in our bloodied mouths. And racism, Madiba reminded us, and I quote, is a blight on the human conscience. The idea that any people can be inferior to another to the point where those who consider themselves superior define and, define and treat the rest as subhuman, denies the humanity even of those who elevate themselves to the status of gods. He could have been talking of the Israeli treatment of Palestinians. But this brings me to an important point. The UN committee that Mama Miriam Makeba addressed no longer exists. It presented its last report in June 1994. Let us also note that the 1973 International Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid is not or was not about South Africa. In fact, South Africa is not even mentioned in the convention. It is about apartheid and it will remain relevant as long as apartheid exists anywhere in the world, as uh, Professor Ron Greenstein uh, said about the Rome Statute. Why then, I ask you, deputy chairpersons, is it that while we see and recognize and are pained by the apartheid that we witness practiced by Israel and other states, South Africa still has not signed the Convention on Apartheid? Do we feel no shame not to have endorsed a legal instrument developed by the international community that was a weapon in our struggle and can be a weapon in the just struggles of other people? I believe that this is a critical task for this parliament to deal with, signing and ratifying the Convention on Apartheid, especially at this time when we are an elected member of the United Nations Security Council, and spearheading a campaign for the reactivation of the Special Committee Against Apartheid so that it might deal with other cases of apartheid as in Israel. Two and a half years ago, the African National Congress resolved at its conference to call on the government to downgrade South Africa's embassy in Tel Aviv to a liaison office. Comrade Naren Singh, South Africa has not cut diplomatic ties uh, with, with Israel. But this resolution was certainly the kind of concrete action that reflects, or will reflect when it's done, South African seriousness in our solidarity with the Palestinian people. That resolution was referred to and supported by President Cyril Ramaphosa, Minister Naleri Pando, even before she became Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, and Minister Lindiwe Sisulu, when she was Minister of uh, International Relations and Cooperation. Minister Sisulu added that the downgrade process had already begun with the recall in May 2018 of our ambassador to Tel Aviv and the decision not to appoint a new ambassador in his place. Moving that process ahead to downgrading the embassy as the ANC has called for will be a concrete expression of our solidarity and this parliament needs to oversee that process. South Africa is currently both an elected member of the United Nations Security Council and chair of the African Union. Each of these comrades is a weighty responsibility. Together, they place on our shoulders as a nation and on your soldiers as leg and, and on your shoulders as legislators a massive set of responsibilities. They also put us in a unique position 
to use these weighty responsibilities in order to give concreteness to our struggle with oppressed peoples. We might have only six months left on the Security Council, but we should not miss the opportunity to use these months to lobby for the world body, which is heavily weighted against the Palestinians, to strengthen international law, pass critical resolutions, and craft new conversations around the Palestinian struggle. Solidarity should not be restricted to the streets, but should forcefully enter the hallowed chambers of the Security Council as well, even if for now only virtually. Especially when Israel treats the United Nations with derision and dismissal. Our role in the EU is perhaps substanti substantively more important. When Israel, the terrorist state that Madiba referred to, is poised to to turn a sufficient number of African states to support its bid for observer status at the AU, when Israel's exploitation of blood diamonds from our continent has deadly implications for a large number of Africans, when Israel is supporting undemocratic regimes militarily against their own people, a critical South African voice in the AU is more important than ever. Not long after US President Donald Trump unveiled his annexation plan for Palestine in January this year, a plan that the Israeli government has enthusiastically embraced. President Ramaphosa said that, I quote, it brought to mind the chronicled history that we as South Africans went through. The apartheid regime once imposed the Bantustan system on the people of South Africa without consulting them and with all the oppressive elements which that plan had. It, the annexation plan, sounds like a Bantustan type of construct, said our president. Our president was, of course, correct in his assessment. However, a slightly deeper examination of the issue demonstrates that, in fact, since the 1990s, when the Palestinian Authority was created, Israel never had any intention of allowing the creation of a Palestinian state. The most it was ever willing to countenance was the possibility of a Palestinian Bantustan, where the so-called government of that entity would have fewer powers and less authority than did Baputatswana. That is the current situation. What is referred to as a Palestinian state today is, in effect, a glorified Bantustan. Despite Israeli leaders occasionally paying tribute to a, quote, two-state solution, there was never any intention for a Palestinian state to exist. The Trump plan has made clear, and the Trump plan has made that clear for those who were previously confused as our president acknowledged in February. How then should South Africa respond in this context? How should this realization be reflected in concrete political and policy positions? At some level, it is of course understandable that South Africa as a member, of, as a member state of the UN and committed to the notion of multilateralism in global diplomacy continues to maintain its support, even if just rhetorical for a two state solution. However, especially in light of the Trump plan, which as any political scientist will tell you, makes a mockery of the notion of state and which proposes a Palestinian entity with no control over its borders, water resources, airspace, electromagnetic spectrum, coastline. In light of this, it is now necessary for us all to revisit this two state idea. Such a reevaluation, by the way, is no longer a radical idea if it ever was. When liberal Zionists are busy reevaluating the idea and, for many, have concluded that the only way forward for the Palestinian and Israeli people is to live together in one state, then it is certainly not radical for a state of the global south with revolutionary credentials to engage in its own reassessment on this issue. It is not sufficient to continue hiding behind the argument that this is the position of the so-called quartet especially when one member of that quartet is the article of this, uh, the architect of this abomination of a plan, and another is happy whining and wringing its hands while doing nothing to ensure that Palestinian territory is not annexed in complete violation of international law. It is also not sufficient to hide behind the argument that we are following the Arab states or the Arab League. Since when has ethnicity granted a people the right of veto over principles and moral questions? These are the same Arab states whose authoritarian regimes oppress, oppress their own people, who have normalized relations with Israel, who have ensured long-term civil wars in various parts of the Middle East and North Africa, 
who undermine democratically elected governments, including on our continent? Why are they our teachers? South Africa, on the other hand, has not been shy since 1994 to challenge the way things are done on the global stage. If we have been forthright, for example, in our calls for reform of the United Nations and other multilater multilateral structures, why are we afraid of being forthright enough to call for a, reass a reassessment of this now implausible and silly tragic idea of a two-state solution? Why are we afraid to even begin that conversation publicly at the level of government, parliament, and the ruling party? This debate, comrades, must begin publicly. Comrades, as we remember Tati Madi Tata Madiba this month and prepare especially for Nelson Mandela Day tomorrow, we must soberly examine his comment about justice and peace everywhere. We cannot allow ourselves to fall into the trap that has long been set for us of extracting Madiba from his legacy as a freedom fighter and see him only as some kind of a teddy bear hugging children and white people. Let us not forget that Nelson Kholislatla Mandela was not sentenced to life in prison because he was a teddy bear, but because he was the founder of Mkonto Wesizwe. Let us remember too, that while Madiba was committed to justice and to peace, apartheid Israel is not interested in peace, unless it is the peace of the graveyard or pieces of Bantustans, unless it is in war and in the theft of Palestinian land. Solidarity, as Madiba reminded, uh, or as Madiba demanded of us, requires support for Palestinian resistance, not fictitious talk of mediating between Israel and, Pal and the Palestinians. And so allow me to end this tribute to him with this quote from 1999, when Mandela, president of the Republic of South Africa, was seated next to Yasser Arafat in Gaza. He declared then, all men and women with vision choose peace rather than confrontation, except in cases where we cannot proceed, where we cannot move forward. Then if the only alternative is violence, we will use violence. A few weeks after he made that declaration, Palestinians began the Second Intifada. Palestinians today find themselves in a position where they cannot proceed, where they cannot move forward. If we fail them, and if we fail the calls for real solidarity from Madiba, we will push them further into a corner where there, where there are no alternatives. Our solidarity must ensure that Palestinians have alternatives that will provide them a just and fair future, free from oppression and free from exploitation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gina. Deputy Speaker, are you there? Deputy Speaker, are you there? If not, let us continue. We will give to Honorable no. Damo. Are you I'm there? I'm here, but I thought I it's okay to proceed as recommended. Uh, let's give Ambassador Mohammed Dangu to speak. Oh, he is, of course, a member of parliament now. Ambassador, uh, I'm told you will make a few remarks and then we'll hand over to the audience to raise questions, comment, and so on. Uh, thank um, you very uh, Madam much. Madam Chair, can I? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Go ahead, then. Go thank ahead. You. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson of the session. Let me say I have visited the area many times as an individual and as a diplomat. But let me just describe the last time I went as a diplomat led by the late Dr. Zola Skawia, who was leading the envoys. Myself, Aziz Pahad, former De uh, Deputy Minister, and Dr. Skawia were appointed as envoys to the Middle East. We visited Algeria, we saw the president. We visited Egypt, we saw the president. We visited Syria, we saw the president. We visited Jordan, we, I think we saw the foreign minister. We visited Israel, and the only person that would see us for 20 minutes was the Director General of Foreign Affairs. And we were now delivering a message from the president of South Africa to the people of the Middle East and North Africa about peace, about the South African experience, and this was the, uh, the, the, the reaction from the Israelis to one of our most senior people, uh, not me, I was junior, um, to say, we will send you a director general for 20 minutes 
to say hello to you is a courtesy call, and that was the end of the uh, conversation. Having said that, I have walked the area at the invitation of the Palestinian Authority, at the invitation of Hamas, at the invitation of Islamic Jihad. And when I was ambassador in Syria, I met all the Palestinian factions. What is the way forward? I think for South Africa, for, AA, for the ANC particularly, and for parliament as well, is to actually bring about the unity of Palestinians to a certain extent. They, they can't love each other. But if they can get to a point where we can facilitate for, facilitate for them to have a kind of Harari declaration, that is a way forward for them. We also met in Israel with the left. And the, the left in Israel is diminishing. Interestingly enough, we met with rabbis. And the rabbis were of the view that the one state solution was, was, was the answer, that two states was anti-Jewish, that two states was discriminatory, and that two states, in fact, was, in my view, international consensus, but not reality. I've walked there. I've driven on the separate roads in South Africa. We didn't have separate roads in apartheid. In Israel, they have separate roads for people. So having said that, how do we take this forward? My own view is I think there are some suggestions by uh, Professor Greenstein. There are some uh, suggestions by Naim Jina. I think we also have to engage with others around the matter. And as we follow consensus of the two-state solution, we should re-examine that. Because the reality is there is no two-state solution. I've been there. I've seen, and I come back and I report back that there is no two-state solution. There's no space for the two-state solution, what they need possibly in the area. And we can't dictate to Palestinians or to the, the uh, communities that, that are the Jewish communities is that they need to follow some kind of example of a non-racial, non-sexist, non-sexistarian democratic state. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Deputy Chair, I'd like to hand over to you uh, so that uh, the two very profound statements that we have been presented with and the practical observations as well of Mohamed Dango has served as a good platform to engage with this uh, uh, remembering where we come from and uh, where we should be headed to. Uh, uh, it was uh, the Malaysian uh, then president who said many years ago that when you get lost along the way, you retrace your step to be able to see where you took the wrong of them, so to speak. We are at that stage, I think, for us to do that so that we can relocate the road we should be taking to the solutions uh, the people on the ground uh, are looking for in Palestine, and that we are part of them, in a sense, as uh, uh, Naeem has articulately presented us with, and so with Professor Greenstein. So let's engage this matter and find ways in which we can do so. I did notice that uh, 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 there are uh, uh, some of the one or two of the envoys are present here who have served before in this debate. Uh, they will engage as well. So let's let's uh, hand over to you, uh, Madam Deputy, to conduct affairs. I have to step off a little bit uh, to talk to Namibians. So uh, I regret that I can't stay further. The solidarity work uh, continues even next door here in our immediate neighborhood. I have some job to do there. So thank you very much. I really appreciate this. I regret I can't stay any further, but thank you very much, Naive. It was good meeting you once more on a good platform. Yeah. And uh, Professor Greenstein, I didn't know you. Uh, I heard about you, but thank you very much. I really appreciate the sensitivity with you to present your issues. They are absolutely critical. Uh, uh, so let's let's keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker. We have got the 
the engagement platform. Uh, members can, uh, can indicate through the raise your hand function, those that want to make input. Please do that, assist us. We do have, we do have the, the engagement. Yes. Uh, yes, we will follow. Mr. Singh, you can continue. Thank and you then very it much. Be, and then it will be back in Adebe. No, thank you to, for all the presentations. Again, I did, I did ask for some comments and yes. questions yes. earlier. Yes. Perhaps they can respond, any of the panelists. Thank you. Now we will take it as soon as we have all the questions so that we have a discussion. Yes, we uh, Peggy Adebe. <clears throat> thank you, Chairperson, for the wonderful hosting of this meeting. But first of all, I'd like to really appreciate the inputs which were made by the presenters. But my point of departure, would like to thank Ambassador Tengo for the good work he has done when we are still in the Middle East. I cannot agree with him more that we as South Africans, we cannot dictate what the Palestinians must do. I think our responsibility is to try to ensure that there's maximum unity between the Palestinians themselves. So that at the end of the day, whatever program you come with, it is a program which is having a blessing of, of the Palestinians. Number two also is that we must never ignore the other voice which is inside Israel itself. Because not all the Israelis are, are, are Zionists. Ne? There are progressive forces there which must be harnessed. But what we must ask here is that we as South Africans, what can we do to get up on? You know, when I was still in the Portfolio Committee of Trade and Industry, there are certain thorough discussions which we had. We said that the, the goods and the products which are coming from the Palestinian authorities, authority, which were not produced by the Palestinians themselves, they must not find a shelf, uh, their, their place in the shelves in our market, in our supermarkets. I think that I really appreciate if comrades like Dumangos, I can see that is on the platform. Also comrades who are serving in the portfolio committee of trading industry, that they do a thorough scan of the retail market and ensure that the goods which are coming into South Africa are really those which are coming from the real Palestinians, which are legit. But what also is very important is that on the international platform, there's something which is certain that Benjamin Netanyahu is ready to annex part of the West Bank. And the world is quiet. I, don't, I think that, that, that quietness is criminal. Because I remember Martin Luther King once said that, there's no crime which is as serious that someone keeps quiet when an injustice is done. I think that we must rise on top of our roofs and shout very high that this injustice cannot continue under our guys. And I agree that with, this, with South Africa's position in the United Nations, I think that there must be resolutions which must be pushed to ensure that that criminality does not take place. And the last but not the least, I think that the issue of our parliament itself, I think that we must have a robust engagement with the Palestinian Authority so that we exchange with the members of parliament of the Palestinian Authority so that we have a thorough annual program. And then at the same time, also ensure that there are scholastic programs between South Africa and in particular our South African universities I appreciate the, the universities of South Africa, which took a stand that they could no longer support the programs of Israel. But I think that what must be extended is that we must get the students from, from Palestine so that they come and get skills here, so that they are, will be able to, to wage a noble fight against the injustice of apartheid. Thank you, Chairperson, for the job well done. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Beggy. Is there any other person that want to to get to become part of the discussion? You can you can show it through the raise your hand function, or you can speak. We will as long as it's not two people that speak at the same time. Yeah. 
you are allowed. It seems as if there is, there is no engagement further from the floor. Then we will go back to our, to our guests and we will allow them to speak. Uh, we will, first of all, we can go back to Professor Greenstein for the question that was asked earlier by the Honorable Singh. Hi, I'm sorry, I am experiencing problem with my camera, so I cannot activate it for some reason, but I hope you can hear me. So let me just respond to the questions. Um, First of all, about the United Nations, obviously the United Nations is a useful body, but the organization within it that calls the shot is the United Nations Security Council. And in the Security Council, the United States has a veto power. And as long as the United States wields its veto power in service of Israel to shield it from criticism, it's very difficult to get anything done there. But there are other United Nations bodies like the Human Rights Council. And the Human Rights Council has undertaken a very useful uh, task of preparing a list of all the companies that do business in the occupied territories, that have a presence in illegal Israeli settlements there. Um, they haven't undertaken any concrete steps yet, but the list is a useful resource that we can uh, use in order to target companies, settlements, products that are in violation of international law. So in that sense, the United Nations or parts of it can be useful. Um, second uh, point I want to refer to is just a question of unity that Ambassador Dango raised, which is a very important one. I just want to add one specific component to it. Um, Palestinians need their own unity, of course, but Palestinians is not just the factions that exist outside uh, the country or in the occupied territories. There's also an important need for unity or collaboration, coordination of efforts between Palestinians under occupations and Palestinians in Israel. And I want to point out that just about a couple of weeks ago, um, the leaders of Hamas, uh, Fatah and the joint list, which operates within Israel itself, uh, participated in a joint conference to uh, call against, to mobilize uh, international support against the Israeli annexation, to coordinate their efforts. That's a very useful initiative. And ideally it will continue in that way of cooperation between the different segments of the Palestinian population. And we need also coordination between Palestinian progressives and Israeli progressives. I mean, it's not that you can coordinate all this from the outside, but to the extent that we can inspire people inside the country to move in that direction, that would be very useful. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Greenstein. We will now, before we give to Naira, I was just thinking whether Comrade Duma want to, Comrade Nkosi, if you actually want to say something just for the own experience that we can actually get from you. Comrade Nkosi, because Becky said you are locked in. Yeah, Th thank you very much, Chairperson. I, I think uh, one won't have specific issues that we may have to raise on the current program of the Portfolio Committee as the Chairperson. But obviously, as you know, that in the continent, the DTIC, in terms of actually ministry and uh, department, we actually looking at the continent and in the area of work we do, I think the Palestinian part is quite critical. And I think um, my colleague uh, Hadeb earlier did actually pick up on that point. But one wanted just to also note the work done by the South African Communist Party in terms of work of solidarity with the Palestinian people. And we think uh, those are kind of areas where in the resolutions and global platforms where these issues are being initiated, 
we can actually have a clearly programmed uh, agenda to be able to ensure support and solidarity. And in these difficult times, I know uh, when the younger people are actually attacked uh, from all direction, we see that as well in the, the charm space where actually there's like a destruction of young male uh, in those spaces. And I think uh, we can actually be able chair to say, let's actually make sure that all other stakeholders in the country get to understand and know what the initiative we're doing. And further, for those who are not interested to ensure that there's freedom and uh, solidarity, we should actually be able to have clear programs to actually highlight, expose, and even actually ensure solidarity for those who are under attack, particularly the Palestinians as well. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Duma. And we will now give to, to Comrade Naim to, to, to actually uh, make his uh, responding remarks. Uh, thank you, Comrade Deputy Speaker. Um, as I usually do, I agree with uh, whatever Mohammed Dango and Ron Greenstein have already said. So I, I agree and support uh, those comments. Um, uh, let me therefore respond to uh, the Honorable Beggy Radebe and uh, Duman Kosi in terms of their comments. And I'm glad that the two of them uh, spoke, being um, one currently on the portfolio committee and the other previously on that uh, committee of trade and industry. Um, Comrade uh, Beggy makes the comment about the role of progressive forces in, in Israel. And I think that, um, that Ron addressed that issue already. So I'm, I'm not going to talk about that. But he goes on to ask the question about what can we as South Africa do, particularly um, in, the, uh, in the area of trade and, and industry. Um, and our dealings with, with Israel. I think that this is a critical uh, area. Beyond just the issue of settlement products, etc., we have the industries, and, and uh, Ran referred to this as well, um, when we have uh, Israeli security industries operating in South Africa, this is a serious problem, particularly when, for example, many of our parastatals, the security equipment there is provided by Israeli companies. When telecom... Uh, telecoms billing systems are done by an Israeli company called Amdocs, and the, the, sister, the, the, the databases of all our metadata for our phone calls is actually located in Israel. This is an issue that, that Parliament really, really needs to take up. When we have a situation when a company that, for some of us, uh, we grew up with in South Africa, an iconic South African company like Clover, is taken over by an Israeli company, we can't just sit back and say, this is business. And uh, as, as the South African government or as parliament, we have nothing to do with business. Um, it, is, it is something that uh, parliament needs to debate, look at how we might address these issues in terms of our stated commitment uh, to Palestinian solidarity. Um, let me also say one or two other areas. Um, one of them is that we have from South Africa a number of South African young people who go and serve in the Israeli Defense Force, um, who fight in the Israeli Defense Force and who perform other functions uh, in the IDF that then allows Israeli occupation soldiers to go and kill Palestinians. We cannot, we should not, as South Africans, allow people who hold our citizenship to go and fight in an oppressive army, in an occupation army like, uh, uh, like the Israeli Defense Force. Um, after the 2008-2009 onslaught, Israeli onslaught on Gaza, there was a huge dossier prepared uh, by a few uh, um, uh, NGOs and solidarity organizations in South Africa, uh, commonly referred to as the Gaza dossier, which was presented to the National Prosecuting Authority. It listed 75 South Africans who had been in the IDF during that onslaught of 2008-2009, young people who proudly displayed their photographs on Facebook and Twitter, etc., in Israeli army uniforms with big guns in front of Gaza, proudly saying that they were part of that uh, defense force. 
Nothing has happened to date to the 75 people. There's no will to, to, to take this uh, further. Yet we have the Regulation of Foreign Ministry Assistance Act in this country. Shouldn't we be doing something about that? Shouldn't Parliament, uh, Comrade Beggy, be looking at this kind of issue? Comrade Beggy asked, uh, made the point about students, and I think a very important uh, point. But you know, Comrade Beggy, that uh, Palestinian NGOs, as well as the Palestinian embassy in South Africa, have been trying for, what, close to two decades now to convince the South African government to provide for Palestinian students scholarships to our universities. Just as, for example, countries such as India, Malaysia, etc., provided scholarships for our cadres in the, uh, in the 70s and 80s to go and study at their universities. We still have not provided any scholarships uh, for, for Palestinian students. The Palestinian students that are here are treated like ordinary international students, not as students coming here un, uh, under solidarity conditions. And they, they uh, study at our universities under those conditions. Um, that needs to change, Comrade Bergi. And I think that parliament has a role to play in that as well. Comrade Naim. Thank you. That's the end of my comment. Oh, thank you. We just we just wanted to hear that. I don't know. I see our house chairperson, Mabel Roto, is also on the platform. I don't know whether she wants to say anything before we conclude the program of the day. Oh, thank you, Deputy Chair. Nothing to contribute. Actually, I was in another meeting. I just logged in some 15 minutes ago, but I thank you for what I've heard so far. There's nothing. Thank to you. Add. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me, let me begin to say that in 1997, Nelson Mandela once said in extending our hands, and I quote, across the miles to the people of Palestine, we do so in the full knowledge that we are part of humanity that is one Close quote. We also heard that this, uh, there is a saying from Madiba that we all know too well that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestine people. Let me first and foremost express our appreciation as Parliament to the two speakers, particularly Professor Ryan Greenstein, on his historical perspective that is giving us as parliamentarians, really a very good view of the historical and particularly the historical ties between South Africa and the people of Palestine. Come, uh, before I continue, Mr. Mutsamai, do you want to say something? I don't want anyone to say that he didn't get, have an opportunity to say what he wanted to say. Mr. Mutsamai? Yes, thank you, Chairperson. Chairperson, okay. I think our uh, South African government and all the people who are in South Africa. We see what is happening in Israel. Israel, they are taking the Palestinian. And the people in Palestine are being killed and are being oppressed. And those children in Israel, they grow up in being oppressed. We are from the apartheid government and we know those people who went to Iraq to support the, the Iraqi government when uh, they, they were attacked by, the, uh, by America, Israel, and other countries. And we have a problem in South Africa to go and assist people who are oppressing other people, forgetting about that we were in apartheid era. When there is a war in Mozambique, we can run quick to Mozambique. When there is a war in Lesotho, we run quick to Lesotho. We send our soldiers to DRC. Why can't we send our soldiers to Israel to show the Israel that we are against oppressed? When they are oppressing uh, the, the Palestinian, we must show them even here, they are not welcome in South Africa. We mustn't take in time. In apartheid era, Countries outside, they were knowing very well South Africa, 
black people were oppressed within their own country. Why don't we show the Israel that we don't like what they are doing to the Palestinians? The Palestinians have been killed. We must think positive. I thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Mr. Mutamai. And I think it is an input that you have Go made. Mr. Mai. We will we will continue to express our appreciation to Professor Greenstein from the Department of Sociology, University of Witwatersrand, and Mr. Naim Gina, the Executive Director for Afro Middle East Center of Research. As the Parliament of South Africa, I think what remains important to us, and I think it was emphasized by Mr. Gina, that we need to take a more radical approach with regards to developing an, an agenda with an objective that we want to realize a just and a better world. A world order that will be characterized by greater security, greater peace and dialogue between nations, nation states. One of the areas that I also, it was raised by the Honorable Dango, the unity of the Palestinian people. I think apartheid was actually defeated by common and united action. There is no way that the Palestinian people will be able to be totally free if we don't see united action across like-minded people and organizations and states that are supporting the Palestinian people. We support our country's foreign policy stance that is guided by the international law with regards to Israel and Palestine. And if we listen to the deliberations, we realize that no revolution has happened or succeeded overnight. It is a product of long struggles over decades that is characterized by upswings, that is characterized by downswings. We can never predict the outcome of the struggle. But on one thing that we agree is that we need to take radical action and to support and assist the Palestinian people to eventually reach the stage where they will say, like South Africans have said, we are a former apartheid state. They will be able to say we are a former oppressed people and we are free. And if we speak about the lasting solution, we need to make sure that the multilateral and the bilateral engagements begin to be intensified by all of us that agree that we don't agree with the fact that the people of Palestine should be oppressed by the people of Israel. Madiba would have agreed with us that we are becoming silent, that we are beginning to forget, that we still have a responsibility to make sure that the world is a better place for all of us and particularly for the children of the Palestine. With that said, let me continue to express our appreciation to everyone that logged on this morning. It was very important that we should not be passive in the face of what happened in the world and the role that Madiba have played. Let us also, on behalf of all of us that are here, express our sincere uh, condolences with the Mandela family on the untimely passing of Comrade Zinzi, someone that understood the role and the responsibility of what her parents wanted to see the world achieve. And this morning, we salute her. We really want to thank everyone, particularly even our councillors and former members that logged in to make sure that you become part of this program. Thank you very much to our project team, to the officers of the deputy chairperson and the deputy speaker for the role that you play to make sure that this is successful, but also for the host officials, for, for, for all of you that make sure that all the programs that we as parliament conceptualize become very successful. Thank you. God bless and enjoy Mandela Day. Do more good in the world. That is what Madiba would have loved to see. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Yes, in my day, 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 y